Um, Super excited today. Uh, our speaker today, Grant Dean, is a research oceanographer at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, UC San Diego. His work focuses on, focuses on breaking waves, underwater acoustics, and glacier acoustics research in the Arctic. He seeks to understand how ocean, atmosphere, and ice-ocean interactions can be measured and monitored using underwater sound and what this means for gas exchange, aerosol generation, melting glaciers, and sea level rise. He earned his doctorate of philosophy from the University of Oxford, England, and master's of science from University of Auckland, New Zealand, where he also earned his bachelor of science. Grant will stay after asking your questions, so please, if you have any questions, uh, save them till then. So please welcome Grant Dean. All right. I want to thank you all very much for having me this morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk to you today about bubbles. Yes, I am actually a serious scientist, but I work on bubbles. Um, there's a video clip uh, that came out recently that gives a bit of an introduction to who I am and my work, and it's going to be a lot more interesting than me telling you myself. So let's do the video. If that's all right, please. From his lab in Barcelona, guest editor and bioacoustics pioneer Michel André is taking us from the east coast of Spain to the west coast of the United States for a final story that is bubbling with promise. At the Scripps Institution of Oceanography on the campus of UC San Diego, a group of scientists are collecting potentially groundbreaking new data from an unexpected source. What are those called? Those little things in the water? Those the bubbles. bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. all about the bubbles. When I tell people that one of the things I work on is bubbles in the ocean, their reaction is, are you serious? Is that really a serious scientific study? But it turns out that bubbles are very serious business. Oceanographer Grant Dean has spent the last 30 plus years studying the role of the ocean in weather and climate, using acoustics extensively in his research. All the musical qualities of water, the tinkling fountain, the babbling brook, the crash of the ocean waves, those come from bubbles. These things are really solid, they're ruggedized for the field, uh, and they make high quality recordings across the, the audio band that we care about. One of his main areas of focus is on melting glaciers in the Arctic, a process that produces an ample supply of bubbles, which, as it turns out, provide a wealth of information. I'm gonna play you the audio clip of what this glacier ice sounds like as it melts. My work has been focused almost exclusively on a glacier system in Svalbard an archipelago between northern Norway and Greenland, which is where I go when I do my field deployments. You hear all those popping sounds, like bacon frying? It's really bright, energetic, like fireworks going off. Each one of those pops is a bubble bursting out of the ice into the water. We want to use the sound of the bubbles exploding out of the ice to figure out how much ice is mounted. By supplementing these recordings with high-speed video, Grant and his team are developing mathematical methods to quantify what they're hearing. We need to count those bubbles. If we can count them, we can figure out how much ice is melting. We want to do that because we want to understand the retreat of the glacier. Is it carving? Is it melting? How is it going to change as the ocean warms? A native of New Zealand, Grant's lifelong affinity for the sea continues to push and inspire his research an endless curiosity that led to the conception and construction of a cutting-edge instrument that will allow scientists from all disciplines to understand the planet in new ways. This is the SOARS machine, the Scripps Ocean Atmosphere Research Simulator. It's a big machine, it fills up most of this building as you can see, and it's designed to reproduce storms in the ocean. A 110-foot wave channel with a wind tunnel on top the intricate contraption has four operating modes that can replicate weather from gale force storms to polar-like conditions. At this time, SOARS is the only instrument on the planet 
that can do all these things at the same time. That makes a device like this a potential game changer, or as he more modestly refers to it, a bridge between the lab and the open ocean. The instruments that you see at the back there, that column with the, with the black hydrophones on it, we propagate sound from those hydrophones through the bubbles, and we measure the acoustical properties of the bubbles that way, and that is one way to size them and figure out how many of them there are. We, as a global culture, have a deep connection with the oceans. We need to start listening to what the oceans are telling us. We need to listen to the open ocean and storms. And we need to listen to what the ice is telling us in polar regions, because now the fate of the oceans depends on us. That's the power of using sound in science. A cross-disciplinary approach to understanding our world. Sound can fill in the gaps and collect new and potentially habitat-preserving information from a planet that desperately needs us to listen right now. <laughs> yeah, well done. All right, so um, a bit of a hack of Shakespeare here. Uh, the title is Bubble, Bubble, Toil and Trouble, and I'm going to talk to you about bubbles. Could I have the next slide, please? And this talk is dedicated to my dear wife, who's right here. Once again, she is going to listen to me talk about bubbles. <laughs> uh, we've just seen that video, so we can skip past that. So bubbles. Bubbles are everywhere. They're in our carbonated beverages. Um, they're in the breaking ocean wave. Uh, bubbles in champagne are very famous. Um, that's okay. Uh, sometimes when people see bubbles, it's a sign of trouble. You know, you, you're walking down and you see a stream and it's, it's filled with this gray looking scungy foam and you're like, oh, that's not good. And so bubbles are sometimes associated with pollution as well. So, and they're important in industrial processes. Um, they're important in chemical processing. Bubbles are kind of, a, an, interestingly enough, an important part of our lives. I don't know if you knew this, but the tinkling fountain, the babbling brook, the, the, the crashing wave, all those sounds come from bubbles. And it's easy to convince yourself of that. Take a glass of water and tip it from one container into another. Do it really carefully so that there are no bubbles. It's quiet. There's no sound. Whereas if you drop it from some height and there's lots of air, you get all the lively musical tones of, of bubbles. So even, even that, who on the planet wouldn't know the sound of running water? It's the quintessential human experience. And they, 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 that comes from bubbles. There's a mathematical side to bubbles. Um, there will be a quiz on that equation at the end. So I please memorize those different terms. Actually, I, I put that up there because I think that there's a beauty and a mathematical elegance to the theory that underlines, underlies bubbles. Um, uh, but I'm not going to talk about that any further. I just wanted to put it up there. Can I have the next slide, please? OK. Bubbles in the ocean. Um, these are, this is a picture of bubbles taken from underneath, looking up towards the surface. Um, that was a breaking ocean wave, or maybe even a diver. And um, the ocean covers 75% of the planet, 71% of the planet. And when the wind blows, waves grow, and those waves break in a splash of spray and air that we call whitecaps. The bubbles in those whitecaps turn out to be really important for weather and climate. And I'll be talking about that a little bit more, but the, there are the bubbles there. This is what they look like from the surface. Um, they come up, you get this uh, mooky uh, cloud underneath, and then on the very surface, foam, marine foam. Great, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so, there are, bubbles do actually, I mean, I'm fascinated by everything bubbly, but bubbles themselves do interesting things when they're first made, that's when they make sound, and then when they, when they burst, it turns out that is an interesting thing that they do as well. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what bubbles do when they're born and when they, when they die. 
Uh, we already talked about the musical sounds of water. Would you mind playing one of those clips, please? The breaking wave on the seashore. Those sounds that you hear come from the bubbles and train by the wave as it overturns, and you can see them on the right there. Could I have the next slide, please? And there's the fountain. Ah, okay. So now we're jumping from the cosmopolitan scene or the shoreline up to the Arctic. And this picture was taken on the northern shores of Jonsen Fjord up in southwestern Spitsbergen, which is an archipelago midway between Norway and Greenland. Um, there's a glacier there in the background, and I'm on the shoreline there with an underwater microphone recording the sounds of the melting ice. And this is what they sound like. Sounds a bit like bacon frying. I'm on a keto diet, so what I think about is bacon. And then um, uh, each of those pops that you hear is a bubble exploding out of the ice into the water. It turns out that glacier ice can be full of bubbles. The ancient air pressurized as the, uh, as the snow falls, and as the ice accumulates above the gas gets very compressed. And then when, it, when the ice melts, it explodes out into the water with these poppling, crackling noises. Could I have the next slide, please? There's a photograph of bubbles in the ice. That's kind of what it, it looks like. That's about, uh, say, a, an inch or so across in scale. So the bubbles are fairly small. Next slide, please. And here are some high-speed video films of the bubbles bursting out of the ice. Each frame, uh, there are 2,000 frames a second in this video. So this is a very short fraction of a second that you're watching in these clips. You can see the ice and the bubbles exploding out. Each explosive event like that creates a in the water, and that's what makes the popping sounds that you heard from, um, from the ice. Cool. Can I have the next slide, please? And the next slide, please. And the next slide, please. Okay. So when bubbles are first formed, they ring like little bells. When they, when they burst, they create a cloud of tiny droplets called um, the scientific term for the miserosol. Typically, when you talk about aerosols, people think of, you know, hairspray or, or something like that. Um, and that is an aerosol. Um, but there are um, aerosols made by breaking waves as well, because the, the waves make bubbles, the bubbles rise to the surface. And when a bubble rises to the surface, it makes this thin film of liquid. And as that film bursts, you get a spray of tiny droplets. And you can see them in these pictures. But typically, the droplets are too small to see. They're in the air, and we breathe them in, but you can't see them. They're too small. These droplets turn out to be fantastically important. Over the great southern oceans, where there aren't other forms of droplet production like this, the sea spray forms the connection between the ocean and clouds. And clouds can either heat or cool the planet. And the scientists who are trying to model what weather and climate is going to look like in 20 years from now or 50 years from now, they can't get the clouds right over the southern oceans. And they are either going to make the planet warmer or they're going to cool the planet down. It would be really great to get the sign right. Um, and part of the problem is that we don't understand these little droplets properly yet. At the center of every cloud drop, and, and there's ice up in these clouds as well. There is what's called a condensation nuclei. There's a little point around which the water vapor forms and makes a drop. And without that, you know, with, without the cloud seeds, you don't, the clouds are much more difficult to form. So the, 
the bubbles that burst over the Southern Ocean make these tiny droplets, and that helps form clouds and ice, which controls weather and climate. Um, can I have the next slide, please? OK. And I'm saying this is all scientifically interesting because, but I think I've already explained why we care about bubbles in the ocean that form clouds and ice. What's scientifically interesting about bubbles bursting out of glacier ice? Well, it's a lot of fun. Uh, but the problem there has to do with sea level rise. Sea level is going up, as you probably all know. Um, we don't own coastal property ourselves. We live in Poway. It's eventually going to turn into coastal property. It's going to be a while, but we'll, we'll get there eventually. Um, there, there are great land-based ice sheets um, that contain vast reservoirs of water. Ice that's already in the ocean as it melts does not contribute to sea level rise. But ice that's on land as it melts raises the oceans. These, there's a tremendous amount of ice in Antarctica, but it's really locked in. The ice sheets there are very, very deep, and it's very hard to melt that ice. And I don't think we're going to see that ice melted in the next thousand years or so. In the Arctic, in Greenland, there's a huge ice sheet in Greenland that contains enough ice to raise the ocean level by about 20 feet. You know, that's a lot. About half of all humankind lives within about 25 to 30 miles of the coast. Bangladesh is essentially one huge marine delta. And sea level rise isn't just about, oh, the mean tide level has gone up a couple of inches. When you get storms, you get storm surge that rushes in. And how damaging that is and how far it goes depends on mean sea level. So sea level rise is, is a very important thing. And we need to figure out how quickly that huge ice sheet in Greenland is going to melt, because it's melting. I've been up there five times. Every time I look, it's more melted. <laughs> There's no doubt about the fact that it's melting. That ice sheet is connected to the ocean through glaciers. They're called marine terminating glaciers. So you've got this big chunk of ice, and it connects to the ocean through these rivers of ice that run down. And the stability of those rivers of ice control how quickly the ice sheet is, is going to go. So we need to understand these, these, the stability of these glaciers. But it's really dangerous to go up to the, to the ice cliff. And a block of ice will fall on your head and you'll drown. Or there'll be a mini tsunami and you'll fall in the water. Or ice will come up underneath your boat and it'll get capsized. So the hope is by listening to the bubbles bursting out of the ice, we can understand how quickly the ice is melting some distance from it safely. And we can do it over a period of decades. I believe we need to be monitoring the ice sheets up there over decadal timescales. And we can do that with the acoustics. Um, could I have the next slide, please? OK, and the next slide, please. All right. Um, I'm, I'm running low on time, aren't I? I'm all right? All right, would you play the video on the, on the left, please? This is very cool. This is an animation by NASA of the little particles I was talking about that come out of the ocean. This shows the source of all the different particles. Um, the, 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 um, the sort of white blue ones at the very bottom of sea spray. But you can see some of these others. The white one in South America there, those, those are from fires, fires burning. Um, the brown are dust from deserts. Um, and then um, the sort of bright orange are um, sulfates from industrial activity from power plants and, 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 and whatnot. You can see there Indonesia's burning, you know, and all the, all the, the fires that are going on. So in a, in a minute, this animation will rotate to the Great Southern Ocean. And you'll see around there, the storm systems whip up the sea spray. And, that, and you can see the hurricanes off on the right there. Those white dots are uh, sea spray from waves breaking. And, um, it's really quite fantastic to see how everything occurs on a global scale. And this is something that really blows my mind. A bubble is so tiny, you know, and who would think that something like that could impact the entire planet? And yet they do. 
It's a bit like us. Every little choice that we make, everything that we do, has a global impact. It's just it's hard for us to imagine that or see that. But there are so many of us now on the planet that collectively every choice we make uh, has an impact. Oh, and there we are, Antarctica and, and uh, the circumpolar jet stream and the uh, sea spray coming off the, the waves and the storms there. Um, and I, um, could I have the next slide, please? Okay. Um, yeah, so I, when I give these talks, I try and, uh, try and remind people that, that everything is connected. I mean, <laughs> it sounds silly, but it's true. And the bubbles are what connect the ocean to the atmosphere in these very interesting and profound ways. Each bubble on its own doesn't make a huge impact, but there are so many of them that by the time you accumulate all those impacts, they uh, literally change the fate of the planet. Um, and, uh, you know, over the, over the course of history, it's been true that humankind has always been vested in the ocean. Since we were walking along the shorelines, uh, picking up seafood and listening to the waves break, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years ago, and so our, and, and, and the ocean controls hurricanes, and the ocean controls weather, and the ocean controls climate. It's only recently that the fate of the ocean now depends on us. And that is now also true. So we are now truly interdependent in, in this way. Um, and then there is this final video is there time to play it? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead and play it. What source is an instrument that reproduces the biology, the chemistry, and the oceanography of the wind driven sea? SOARS stands for the Scripps Ocean Atmosphere Research Simulator. It's an instrument funded by the National Science Foundation, supported by UC San Diego. We've always known that the air sea boundary is important. What we didn't understand was how the combination of biology and chemistry and wind and waves were all working together to create this unique and special place that impacts weather and climate. How are we going to understand this complex connected system so that we can predict what future climate is going to look like and what future weather is going to look like? So one of the things that's different about this is it's got, you know, it's, it's huge for one, but it has a enclosed air where everything is clean. And so the gases that come out, everything that comes out, comes out into this clean atmosphere. So we can actually study what directly comes out of the ocean. And so now we're taking the next step and being able to simulate many more oceans, different temperatures. We can basically make all these different conditions to look at how processes in the ocean are affecting our atmosphere and our climate and human health. We operate SOARS by introducing seawater that we're able to pump in directly from the ocean. A paddle pushes that water along in a 120 foot long channel, producing waves up to three feet in height. A water temperature handler in the wave channel can heat or cool the seawater anywhere within a range between 33.8 degrees and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Because the composition of the air is vitally important in creating a controlled environment, we installed an air filter capable of removing all ambient particles one third of a thousandth of an inch from the air we draw in from outside the simulator. We provide the same light that organisms in the ocean would experience through the use of six solar tubes positioned just above the channel. A wind turbine can take the air that we purified earlier and blow it through the channel. We can reach wind speeds up to 63 miles an hour near hurricane force. Finally, just as we can manipulate the temperature of the water, we can also control air temperature. An air temperature handler can produce temperatures ranging from 86 degrees Fahrenheit to negative 7 degrees. SOARS has four operation modes. There's the wind wave mode, where we make waves and blow wind. 
the aerosol mode where we study tiny little droplets that come out of the wind-driven ocean, go into the atmosphere and form clouds and ice. We have the ecology mode where we study the organisms that live near the surface of the ocean and polar mode where we can cool the water down to freezing temperatures and make sea ice. One of the things that's very important about SOARS is that it brings all the capabilities of our older instrumentation into the future, as well as provides a whole bunch of new capabilities that we couldn't even dream of a few decades ago. The ability to control the temperature, to control gas concentrations, all these things let us simulate not just what's happening around us now, but what's going to be happening on the Earth and into the ocean in the future. All right, thank you. So sometimes people ask me, you know, okay, great. Now we know, so what? Okay, how is that gonna help? Is it gonna stop climate change? It's like, well, no, it's not. But I do this work because I have a fundamental faith in people. I believe if people are given good information, accurate information, and understand the consequences of their choices, they will make good choices. I truly believe that. So I see myself as a public servant, and my job is to go out and collect that information, understand it, and deliver it to people, and then what they do with that is their business, but I believe that they will do good things with it, that we will learn to live well on the planet, and we'll learn to live well with the oceans and that we can have a bright future if we understand our collective role and we're well informed. And that is the end of my talk.